I have a, a really good friend who's an anthropologist and works on theater. And his idea is that Placido Domingo, how many of you know who Placido Domingo is? Okay, he's a famous tenor. And we actually heard him in the Los Angeles last fall. It, it was un incredible, he's wonderful. He makes your heart beat fast. He makes you feel love. He, he makes you want to hug somebody. How does he do that? So my friend who works in the theater has written several articles about this. He's tested the, the harmonic series that Placido projects from his voice. And he projects the, the, the harmonic series that matches a baby's cry. And so by his voice mimicking the sound of an infant's cry, we humans respond. We love his voice. So, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about science. So how do we hear? Where, what is happening with all of these noises that come in? And I'm going to talk something about um, my science work. Um, I had a, when I was figuring out how to give this talk, I didn't know if I should present my um, theoretical ideas based on the work of others, or if I should tell you about what I'm doing right here and now in, at UNM and in my lab. And I decided that most of what I'm going to tell you is what I'm doing right here and now in New Mexico, my lab. What, I've been in, what I started being interested in is how is this, what is the sensation of, of sound? How does our ear pick up sounds and noises? And then I started thinking about how do those get into the central nervous system so that we know that we're hearing something. We could, our cochlea could be responding, but if there's no connection, we don't know up here in our higher organizing centers that we're hearing something. And there's actually a very complicated pathway between the cochlea and the brain. And as we study this more, and functional magnetic resonance imaging is revealing some very interesting things about this pathway, as we study it more, we're beginning to understand how the sounds that we hear in the ear get to these, um, these more thinking centers in the cortex and these more feeling centers in the, in the middle part of the brain. So first I'm going to talk about sensation, then I'm going to talk about propagation and connection, and uh, finally I'll talk a little bit about the forebrain, executive functions, and the limbic system. So sensation of tone became, really the Greeks didn't understand this and they didn't have much to say about it. And we didn't have much to say about it until the mid 19th century when Hermann Helmholtz, who was a physicist working in Germany, wrote this book on the sensations of tone. And actually this is a picture um, from a, a 1920s translation of his book in which I'm showing you the, um, the ear canal. Here's a pinna, the ear. And here's the outer ear canal. And sound comes in this way, and it activates a membrane here, which activates movements of three little bones inside what's the middle ear. So when you have an ear infection, this is what hurts. And then, or when you have an inner ear infection, this is what hurts. And this drains into your throat. So if you get a sore throat and you get a bad cold, this part kind of gets swollen up too. And sometimes it doesn't drain anymore. And we think that's how ear infections happen. Ear infections can cause this tympanic membrane to blow out, and then you go deaf. Um, sometimes ear infections can cause these three ossicles not to be able to move freely with each other, and that's how we amplify sound. So this is our amplifier. So the vibrations that hit the tympanic membrane are amplified by these three little bones, and they hit a window here on the cochlea, which in humans is circuitous, a spiral. But in chickens, is straight, in frogs, is straight. And so a lot of people study the cochlea, study it in frogs and chicken because it's easier to look at the straight one. Trying to figure out the physics and fluidics of the inner um, canal of, this, of the cochlea has been a challenging problem for many people, and I don't think it's been solved yet. Out of, the, out of this sound system, so all of this is vibrations that respond to noise. And out of that comes the vestibular nerve, which carries electrical signals to the brain based on what noises have been perceived or sensed. Inside the, co inside the cochlea, there is a tectal membrane and another membrane. And between those two membranes are the hair cells that are actually the sense organs. And as these two membranes um, move with respect to each other, it causes these hairs that touch the tectal membrane to move. And as these hairs move, their movement changes the electrical properties of the cell 
and that those electrical properties are communicated to the nerve that's going to go to the brain. People have been really interested in how do you distinguish different sounds, different tones, and Lou Tilney um, at University of Pennsylvania in biology was instrumental in understanding how that works. So it turns out that all these hair cells have different length of, of hairs that stick up and touch the tectal membrane. So at the proximal end of the cochlea, the hairs are short, and at the distal end, they're very long. And so the length of the, of the, hair, of the hairs on the hair cell and are proportional to its position along the cochlea, and those are proportional to the type of noise, that, uh, the pitch of the noise, the, um, the high or low pitch of the noise that the hair cell will respond to. So um, Lou Tilney looked at these, um, at, these, at these hairs in very um, high details. There's a very high resolution electron microscope image of the top of one of those hair cells. And these are the little fingers, the hairs, that would touch the tectal membrane that's been peeled away. They are tethered inside the cell to another bundle of a protein called actin that holds them in place. And Lutilny, by developing electron microscopy of being able to look at them, could even look at this high magnification and see that these active filaments were all oriented in the same direction with a plus end on the top and a minus end on the bottom. And the, the plus end is called the barbed end and the minus end is the pointed end of active filaments where they've been decorated with this uh, other protein that makes them look like arrowheads. So he posed the question, of how do you get the different lengths of the hairs? Because if you don't have the different lengths of the hairs, you can't distinguish pitches. You couldn't listen to music at all. You probably would have a hard time understanding language because language uses a lot of pitches. So he thought that up at the tip of these hair cells was some kind of a machine that determined their length. So it could ca either cap them and keep them at a single length or it could help them to grow. <coughs> He discovered that during embryogenesis, all the, hair, all the hair cells start out at the same length, and as you move along the cochlea, different hair cells grow hairs longer. So he discovered that at a certain stage of embryogenesis, some stopped growing and others continued to grow. And he asked, what is the protein complex, the machine that could do that? So this is a higher magnification um, from actually some of my work using electron microscopy with Tom Reese, who's at National Institutes of Health and also at the Marine Biological Lab. And this is that filamentous uh, protein that was making those hairs. And it's kind of helical, and it's only six to eight nanometers in diameter. And one of the things I did in Bruce Albert's lab, as um, Jen said, I worked in Bruce Albert's lab, was look for something that would produce this nucleation, a rate-limiting step that would make these active filaments grow longer, grow longer or cap them. And I was really fortunate to discover several proteins that, uh, that controls the length of active filaments. So this is a stereo scanning electron microscope image of the hairs, the hairs on this, the apical surface of these hair cells, and they're organized in this V-shape. And these are the outer hair cells, and these are the inner pillar cells. And if we stain these with one of the antibodies, an antibody against one of the proteins I discovered, we find that it stains all of the hair cells, but not much else. And let me see. And if we stain with another antibody, it's staining the bottom of the hairs and not the length of the, of the shaft. And we can look at them on the side. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the hairs. And this is a fluorescence image of hairs that are stained with one of the proteins we discovered, captain, and, it, and another protein, actin, which is the filamentous protein. And you see that captain is at the tips of these hair cells. And it now looks like captain is indeed the, the protein that manages whether they're long or short. We then looked. Um, we looked in human families with, that had inherited deafness to see if they had mutations in this captain protein, and we found the captain protein gene, and we found one family that's actually a family of violin makers. What was really interesting is they heard exceptionally well up into age 40, and then they went deaf. So something about the kind of protein that they had 
was causing their hair cells to be exceptionally sensitive, but then be uh, destroyed by their, maybe by their sensitivity. So we found that, that this DF, it's called deafness nucleus A, um, this number four was in the same domain as the domain encoding captain, which we at that time was, were calling 2E4. Um, I have some pictures that I can show people if you're interested afterwards about what happens to people who have a complete deletion of this gene. And it doesn't just affect the ear because apparently elongating active filaments has roles in many other parts of the body, not just the hair cells of the ear. The microvilli of the intestine, platelets that cause coagulation and, or can mediate coagulation in the blood and all sorts of other places need actin polymerization machines like Captain. But for the purposes of talking about hearing, we now know that the cell architecture and the mechanics of sound sensation are intimately connected. And we know that 2E4 Captain is at the tip of the hair cells and regulates their elongation, and R23 is actually at the base of the hair cells and helps to tether them. For people who go deaf, there is a wonderful, I don't know, I guess 20 years, Scott, you probably know how long this has been around, has, have been this device that's called a cochlear implant. And so for people who actually lose their hair cells, we can replace that with an electronic device. This was one of the very first electric, electrical human mind brain, no, um, electrical human interaction, electrical biological interaction where there's an amplifier here that's sensing sound. It translates that into electrical signals that are sent down this wire into the cochlea and activate the nerves that propagate into the brain. In the absence of hair cells, people can hear through this device. Once they had this device and could help people hear, we began to realize that only 30, 40 percent of people are deaf because of this problem. Other, the other deafness that we have is that it belongs to the propagation into the brain. And now the House Ear Institute is working on deeper brain stimulators that can override deafness in deeper parts of the brain. So how does that work? Well, here's a diagram of the cochlea. Here's where the hair cells are living on that membrane. Here's the tectal membrane. And here are the nerves that come out. If we look closer at it, these um, hair cells are sending their messages down to the neurons. They gather together here in what's called the cochlea nucleus and then send their um, message into the brain. So for the first stop is into the midbrain into the superior, near the superior olivary nucleus and the, and the cochlear nucleus in the brain. And these then send electrical impulses up throughout the brain to the auditory tectum and through the brain into the, um, to the auditory cortex, which is where we um, hear language and interpret language. So how does that happen? So one of the next things that I've started to work on in my lab was looking at this, this propagation event. Now, this, the giant squid that Jan mentioned um, that they fished for out of the uh, lab at Woods Hole was the creature that um, two people won a Nobel Prize for discovering that the propagation of electrical signals in, along axons, which are the long arms of neurons, was by, via ion channels. So it's not actually electricity, but it's sodium and potassium which are salts that go in and out of the axon and that produce this very rapid electrical signal. In some places in our body, the neuronal cell body is very, very, very far away from the part of the, cell, of the neuron that gives a signal to the next neuron in a circuit. That means that this, this action potential has to be really fast to, to move all the way down there. But it also means that something has to sustain this mechanical structure. And those things are proteins that are synthesized in the cell body and travel all the way down to the very distant portion of the neuron and build those synapses and sustain them. So one of the things that I became interested in is how does that transport of goodies from the cell nucleus to the synapse work? And I got a chance to do that at the Marine Biological Lab. Now you've been teased by hearing about the Marine Biological Lab for a while. It's here on, on Cape Cod.